<coughs> Hello, I'm Tim Arnold. Uh, what I am is the director of stuff and things at the Las Vegas Pinball Collectors Club, a legal not-for-profit corporation. We run a pinball museum in Las Vegas. Currently, we're uh, on a site on Tropicana Avenue that's 8,600 square feet. Uh, we're kind of different than everybody else's approach to a pinball museum. We're kind of a pinball museum disguised as an arcade. We're open 365 days a year. Um, we never close. We're open from 11 a.m. till 11 p.m. Uh, most pinball museums are limited hours, uh, more of a boutique-y kind of thing. We're more like a mass entertainment kind of thing. Uh, we're also uh, dedicated to two purposes and only two purposes. First of all, having the pinball museum open, and second of all, donating money to local social service charities. We've given away several million dollars over the years to local homeless organizations, uh, youth organizations, things like that. We like to think of ourselves as a Kiwanis Club for pinheads. Um, we get together and, and do charitable acts, although in the last three or four years, we haven't been doing much of the charity work because we've been building up a war chest, a building fund, trying to get out of the facility that we're in on Tropicana. Uh, it became clear a few years ago that we had some problems with uh, the current Pinball Hall of Fame, mainly having to do with space. Uh, we have one restroom with one toilet and one sink and there's times when I'm working in there that it takes me half an hour to take a piss. Um, and that's just unacceptable. We also have a little tiny work area that uh, doubles as a customer service area and a um, parts storage area, so we're constantly tripping over things. And the other thing is I've got a storage building in my backyard with 800 machines and I have no way to display all these machines. So the idea was three or four years ago that we were going to start looking around and start saving up some money so that we could move from our current facility to something larger. And a lot of people have asked me, why is it that you're so hung up on buying a building instead of renting a building? Um, first of all, I don't like landlords. When we first started out the pro at the project, we were down the street from where we're at now, and we were paying $5,600 a month to a landlord that wouldn't fix the parking lot, uh, wouldn't fix the air conditioning, uh, wouldn't return his phone calls, and we just figured it's better if we could do it ourselves. And in hindsight, we're actually going to make negative rent on the facility we're in uh, when we sell it because of the increase in the property values that happens with inflation. Um, uh, so we've, we've done real well owning it ourselves. Also, we don't pay property taxes if we're a not-for-profit. If you pay rent, 20 to 40 percent of your rent passes through the landlord to the county as property taxes. So uh, we always figured it was better to control our own destiny, and that's what we've done. And if you ever have any questions about any of our financials, you can go online to guidestar.org and see our last three years of tax returns for free. Just uh, search for the word pinball, and the Las Vegas Pinball Collectors Club will come up. You can see our tax return. I sign the return every year under penalty of perjury, stating that we don't pay anybody anything. We're still an all-volunteer organization at this point. Uh, sometime in the near future, we're probably going to have to start paying people simply because we're just about at the end of what we can do with an all-volunteer staff. So um, what we figured out a couple years ago is that the current facility was just too small. Now, we own a vacant lot next to the current Pinball Hall of Fame that's two acres. And one of the things we'd looked at was building a building on that two acres but we had a couple problems with that. First of all, the zoning is more restrictive than we would like. Uh, we have height restrictions as well. And also, just between you and me, the neighborhood is changing. Um, 
and there's a lot more weirdness in the neighborhood than when we started. Uh, we're also surrounded by rental housing, and the problem with somebody who doesn't own their housing is that they tend to be transient, and they don't care about things, and their kids tend to run wild, and we've had a lot of trouble with what we call local talent uh, coming in and causing trouble. And the other factor is that we finally figured out that about two-thirds of our business is now tourists, and only about a third of it is locals. So if we could figure out a way to get closer to the tourists, uh, that would be better for us. I've talked to people that spend 20 to $25 to take a cab one way, so they're looking at a $50, $40, $50 uh, bill to get out there and back, and they're spending 10 or $15 playing pinball. If we could be on the strip, you could literally walk there or you could take a bus for $2 or the cab ride would be a lot less. We started looking around in earnest about three or four years ago. Um, we came this close to buying a Kmart. Uh, a Kmart went out of business farther out than where we're at now, but it was 86,000 square feet. That's 10 times the current Pinball Hall of Fame. We had entered into a negotiating agreement with the owner. Uh, we were negotiating on price when suddenly a church group that wanted to open a school um, just swooped in, paid the list price on it, and bought it. So once again, I tried to negotiate a little bit on the price and got screwed up on that one. Um, so we kept looking and then all of a sudden, a, a, a vacant lot came up on the Strip. I don't know if you're familiar with the Strip, but it's divided into the north part of the Strip, the central part where all the big, huge hotels are, and then there's the South Strip, which is currently, other than the Mandalay Bay, largely empty. Um, this lot came up on the, the south end of the Strip. It was platted originally in 1952 as the Sombrero Motel. It's uh, kind of a freakishly looking lot. If you can see this a little bit here, uh, it's only 120 feet wide, but it's 640 feet deep. It was originally 700 feet deep, but the two-lane asphalt in 1952 that went to Los Angeles has been enlarged and enlarged and enlarged to the point where we have 640 feet. Um, it was originally run as a motel under different names until 1999 when it was basically closed and the county wanted it out of there because it was a haven for drug dealers and prostitution and it was really nasty. At one point they'd had their water turned off. Uh, so th then the uh, owner that bought it demolished the hotel um, and sold it to, to a speculator, a land speculator, for $18 million. This was in the uh, 2000s. That person defaulted on the loan and the bank repossessed it and sold it to a different group who paid $16 million for this piece of, of land. The size of the piece of the land is 1.76 acres, but there's two problems with the property in the rear, there's a, a utility easement that we can't build on, and in the front, there's a, an eventual road taking, which may or may not ever happen, but we can't count on it not happening. So it actually nets down to 1.6 acres to give you an idea of the size of it. Um, so the second guy defaulted at $16 million, but instead of the bank coming in and repossessing it immediately, the defaulted note passed between three or four different people and ended up three years ago in the possession of a New York investment company who bought a bundle of notes, uh, including the defaulted Sombrero note. Um, they had listed it for sale originally for $8.2 million for the land, which is about half of what the last guy paid for it. It didn't sell for a couple years. Um, they took it off the market, and then about a year ago, it came back on the market for $6.5 million. 
Now, I don't know if anybody's familiar with LoopNet, but LoopNet is a commercial real estate um, listing service that anybody can go to for free on the internet, and it's kind of taking over the way the internet has taken over other things. You no longer need a multiple listing service. You no longer need a real estate agent to look at property for sale commercially. And I was cruising LoopNet one night, and I call it real estate porn. Um, and I came across this lot, and I said, wow, that's kind of weird. There's an actual lot on the strip for sale. So we started talking with the owner, and he said 6.5 is the price on LoopNet, but if you want a quick cash sale, we'll sell it for 5.2. So once again, me being a cheap prick bastard, I had to negotiate a little bit. So we signed a letter of intent, which allows us to negotiate in good faith with a certain set of rules, and we started negotiating with them. Uh, we figured that we would open at four and a half million, and that they would open at 6.5, and we would settle at 5.2, maybe a little bit less. So we were going back and forth, and we had offered 4.7 million for it, um, when suddenly they broke off negotiations and said, we're tired of this, we want to sell it quickly, we need some money, uh, and they, they canceled our negotiation and put it in a real estate auction. And this really angered me, but once again, if I just would have paid the man his price, I would have owned it. So we went to the auction figuring that there'd be a lot of other people bidding and there's no way we would end up with it. Um, and this was a weird auction. It had a hidden reserve, which meant that the bidding started at $1 million, but none of the bids were binding legally until you hit a certain price, which nobody knew what that price was except the seller. So I'm on the computer. This wasn't a live auction. It was on the computer. And I had a, for the last five minutes of the auction, you're on a telephone as well as on the Internet in case there's a hiccup. There's also a, a feature that in the last minute of the auction, if there's any bids, it automatically extends the auction by five minutes. That way, there's none of the last minute bid slamming that happens on eBay. They've got a word for it, I forget what it is. But we were there, I had my, my representative from 10X, the auction company, on the phone with me, and when I first called him up, he said, well, one of our guys called in sick, so I actually have on one phone the owner of the property, and I have you on the other ear. So it gets to five minutes out, and we're at 3.8 million. No, uh, 4.2 million. And I'm sitting there in the last five minutes, the rules of the auction change, and we were still not at the reserve. So the reserve was somewhere above 4.2. So it comes down to the last five minutes, and all of a sudden I hear my 10X re representative tell the owner, well, one of the bidders dropped out. I'm going, why am I hearing this? And then at one minute to the closing of the auction, he tells the owner, uh, the other bidder just dropped out. And I'm sitting there saying, other bidder. So there was only two? What does this mean? So then it, 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 um, it, it got into this point where the bid was 4.3 million, which met the reserve, which was stupid because if we had already offered them 4.8 million, why did they put a reserve less than what we'd already offered them? So the whole thing made no sense. So it comes down to the last 10 seconds. 9876543321 boom the screen turns green we owned it for 5 to 600,000 dollars less than what we'd already offered them and i was willing to go to 5.2 so we ended up getting it for considerably less than what we would already offered them uh, a real convenient way to to remember what we paid for it is after all the fees and we had to pay the auction fee and all that other stuff, out the door, park it in your garage for four, five, six, seven, four million five hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars The most I have ever spent on anything in my life. So we, uh, 
we were happy that it happened, but I was and still am scared shitless because all of a sudden we're playing in a league that's way, way bigger than anything I ever contemplated. If you look at the strip, which is usually defined as Sahara to the north and Russell to the south, um, there's only 32 beneficial owners of property on the whole strip. The vast majority of the property on the strip is owned by large casino companies and would never be for sale at any price. Um, it's very rare that a bite-sized piece of the strip becomes available. It's even weirder that a not-for-profit social club would end up buying a piece of it. And so that's where we are as of this moment. So if you look, I'm gonna go mobile here. If you look at the, the thing here, Basically, this is a drawing that our architect prepared. Uh, this is the strip right here. The shooting happened up here at the festival grounds to the north. This way is north, that way is south. The world's largest hotel corner is eight-tenths of a mile up here. Walking distance to uh, the MGM, the New York, New York, the Excalibur, and the Tropicana. There's 15,000 hotel rooms walking distance away. Um, and right across the street is the fourth largest convention center in the world, the Mandalay Bay Convention Center. Directly to the south here across this vacant lot is the world's largest Harley Davidson dealer. Uh, Harley riders are our uh, key market, old farts with busted parts that want to relive their youth. Look around you and you will see <laughs> exactly what you are. So the Harley is great for us, and also the famous Las Vegas sign is in the median of Las Vegas Boulevard right here. Now, years ago, that sign was sitting there derelict and broken, and a guy that ran a casino <clears throat> right here, where the Harley dealer now sits, decided that somebody ought to rehab that sign. So he paid a lot of mo his own money to rehab the sign, and then people started flocking to it and they started filling up his casino parking lot. So then the county said, hey, this sign is pretty neat. Maybe we should do something with that. So they put grass around it and they built a small parking lot, which became a bigger parking lot, which became a bigger parking lot, which became a bigger parking lot. So now they have almost a half a mile of parking lot in the middle of the Las Vegas Boulevard that you can drive into, park, wait in line to see the sign, get your picture taken with the famous sign, and if you're looking at and taking pictures of the famous sign, you're also taking pictures of the edge, the front edge of the sombrero lot where the strip sign ordinance says we can put a giant sign right here. So what I'm counting on is that people will be down here taking their picture and they'll see this giant sign that says pinball machines and they'll say I wonder what that is and they'll come across and play it here. Uh, also keep in mind that there's different economic levels of tourism on the strip. At the very top of the pyramid which is very narrow you have people that fly in on their private jet and they do the ultra high luxury thing and they spend a thousand dollars for bottle service at the club. That's very narrow. At the bottom of the pyramid which is huge and wide you have the day trip tourists, the deadbeats, the scumbags, the pinheads, the people that come to town and don't want to spend a lot of money. Those are our peeps. One of the reasons that we've done so well on TROP is that we realize we're at the bottom of the food chain and we don't pretend to be anything else. This is an attraction that you can come to, not pay an admission charge and not pay to park. You walk in, you're free to look around if you like, you don't have to spend any money, there's no high pressure. You, you don't have to pay $20 to get in and look at a bunch of stuff that you decide at the last minute, I don't like this. You're just kind of, you know, on your own. It's a self-guided tour. It's an automated facility. We usually have one, possibly two people there to help you. Uh, we're all rude, we're all abusive, we don't want to talk to you. So it's kind of anti-cool, but the people that come to the Las Vegas sign 
are exactly the kind of people that we want as customers because they love it, they can go there for free, and there's been a huge backlash on the Strip about the fact that the giant casino companies, there's mainly two, Caesars and MGM, most of the South Strip is owned by MGM. Um, we've had meetings with some fairly high up people in the MGM organization and we've assured them that this little project here, which they could squash like a bug, they could literally just say, get rid of that thing, we don't like it, and it would happen. Uh, we've had meetings with them and assured them that, you know, this is exactly what we say it is. It's no threat. They just spent uh, millions of dollars opening up an eSports arena in the pyramid-shaped Luxor directly across the street from us, and we wanted to make sure that they knew that we weren't trying to compete with them. We weren't trying to compete with their arcades in the Excalibur or the New York, New York, uh, that we were just this quirky little thing. Please leave us alone and don't kill us. And that's kind of, we got word back through our architect that they're fine with this as long as we don't become something else. So we have to be very careful that we stay museum-like. So where we're at right now exactly with this project is that we own this. The Las Vegas Pinball Collectors Club owns this property. Again, it's freakishly narrow and freakishly deep. It's like a shotgun lot. Um, we've worked with our architect and we've come up with this plan which has been approved by the building department, the fire department, and a separate level of strip development that you have to go through. Basically what we've got is a big, almost square building to the rear of the lot. Um, also the rear of the lot is serviced by something called the Dewey Drive Extension, which is an asphalt track on private land that comes back here and services three airport maintenance hangars here. So there's actually a publicly owned parking lot to the rear of the building that's serviced by a road that doesn't exist. It's, it's an asphalt track on private land, except for a county-maintained bridge right in the middle of it. So it's, the fire department just about had kittens trying to figure out whether we could count that as rear access to the building or not. And what they eventually came up with is, no, that's not a roadway. So we had to have, if you look at the design here, we have a, a, this big turnaround area here, which is a waste of a bunch of parking spaces, but we have to be able to have a fire truck turn all the way around here. So this angle and this angle are less severe than normally you would have. So if you take this space, this is 27,000 square feet. That means that the existing Pinball Hall of Fame would fit just about exactly to the inch in the front third of this. So what we're talking about is three times the space of the Pinball Hall of Fame. Um, that's a little on the, I would like four, maybe five times. That would give me more workshop area, more parts storage area. But we're working with the architect to put a mezzanine or a basement in for non-public areas so that we could do that without impacting our floor space. Um, 27,000 square feet here. Uh, there's an area back here that's two utility easements. We can not pave it and we can't count it towards our parking here, but we can park licensed vehicles on dirt back here. So what we're gonna do is um, either plant a garden back here and use it for private parties, or we're gonna park storage trailers with permanent trailer plates back here so that they're licensed vehicles. Uh, again, the level of nitpickiness you would not believe. We have to have two permits from the FAA to erect a tilt-up building. We need one for the building itself, and we need a temporary three-day permit for the crane, because the crane, in order to tilt up the building, has to be taller than the building. And apparently there's some autopilot function on airplanes now that if you're heading for a crash, it'll level out higher than any existing structure. So we have to have two permits in order to build the building from the FAA. Uh, we also have to put soundproofing in the walls and in the ceiling because we're in the airport area. Um, so we're looking at this 
And this, um, the timeline on this is a year and a half to two years. Um, and now we're going to get into the real scary part of it, the financials involved with this project. We paid $4.6 million for this building. Now, out of that, we had cash on hand of $3.6 million. It's like I say, we had cut back our charitable giving for the last three or four years, and basically we were plowing all our profits, just putting it in a bank account, using it as a war chest, so that if we found something we liked, we could buy it without a lot of bank loans. So we had $3.6 million in the bank. Now, we have a lot of equity built up in the facility on Tropicana, but the problem is we can't sell that until the day we open this. So I reached into my pocket and took out $1.2 million and loaned it to the club uh, as a bridge loan so that we could get to the $4.6 million to buy the vacant lot. Now, in order to build a building, the architect says we could do it for $100 a foot, but you better count on 125. So $125 a foot times 27,000 is three and a half million. So you take the 4.6 and the 3.5, you're looking at an $8.1 million facility. Now, we had talked to the bank and they were ready to loan us this amount of money based on the fact that we had free and clear a facility on Tropicana that we recently had appraised at two and a half million dollars. And we also owned this less the bridge loan of 1.2. So they said, yeah, you're, you're well equipped to handle this. You've got a plan to pay for it. We will go ahead and loan you three and a half million dollars. And then about three weeks ago, a car wash company called me up and said, we wanna buy your existing facility on Tropicana. And I said, well, I can see where you want to take the vacant lot and put a car wash on the vacant lot, but we can't leave until we get this ready. So why don't you call me back when you see this done, then I'll go ahead and sell you the thing on Tropicana. And he said, no, we've got a plan. We want to put up our car wash now. What we're willing to do is pay you today and give you free rent, you can stay in the building that you're in in Tropicana for a period of time while you build this and we will pay you today. So I said, sign me up, I'm there. So as of the day before I left, we're supposed to sign a sale agreement and start escrow on selling the existing Pinball Hall of Fame for $2,850,000, which is considerably higher than our appraisal. He, he wants it so bad he's willing to pay above what the appraiser said it was worth. Uh, and he's willing to give us 21 months free rent at $10,000 a month. That puts us over $3 million in actual value from what we paid a million five for. So again, you look at it as negative rent. We paid a million five. We're selling it for over three. And we've squatted there for eight years for negative money. That's how rich people get rich isn't hustling pinball machines. It's from buying and selling real estate. There's a clue for y'all. But uh, if that deal goes through, that means that after we pay commissions and closing costs and all the other stuff, we can take it home, put it in the garage for $2.8 million. That's what we will have 120 days from Monday. And we will also be able to stay in our current facility for 21 months for free. And if we need to, if our, something happens to the timeline on this project, we can buy up to 10 additional months at $15,000 a month, which is pretty high rent for a space like that. But if it's an emergency, I guess I'll have to pay it. If at the end of the additional 10 months, the car wash guy said, look, I'll work with you, but I can't legally promise you that will continue to rent for you. So worst case scenario is that they kick us out at the end of that long period and I actually get a first, first time in years, I get a vacation. And I let the builder go ahead and finish this and I come back when this is done. So if you take 
the $3.6 million we had in cash, the bridge loan of a million two, and the 2.8 that we are going to get from the sale of our existing facility, it comes up with 7.6 million against 8.1. So if you squint a little and look at it kind of crooked, we're almost done with this project today, except for the fact that the club owes me $1.2 million, and the interest clock is running on that. Uh, the way we set the interest on that is we took the bank loan. The bank said we could have it at this percent relative to the prime rate. And I said, okay, I don't want to take advantage of the club here, so I will do one percentage, less point, one percentage point less than what the bank is charging. That way it's obvious that retail is here. Tim is not taking advantage of the club because he's getting this interest rate here. It's basically what I could get for putting the money in a CD. So I'm not getting rich off this, and the club is able to use my money to get this project done. Now, it gets a little weirder because this lot here, which is five acres here, and this lot here, which is five acres between us and the Harley-Davidson, is also currently vacant land. This and this is owned by the same owner. He also owns 22 acres up here, and we contacted him and said, look, we're kind of like right in the middle of your thing here, and we would rather be kind of more to the south, closer to the sign. Tell you what we'll do. We'll take this, slide it down here, and we'll trade you even up. And he said, you're crazy. Don't want to do it. I, I, I realize that this would be more valuable, but you have to pay me some money. So we came up with, working with our architect, 40 feet as the ideal amount that we would want to add on to this if we could. That's based on the fact that anytime you build anything, it's always the parking that trips you up because this is easy, fitting this in is hard. And you have to have four spaces four parking spaces for every thousand square feet of retail. A museum needs 3.3 spaces per thousand for a museum. So this is compliant at 3.3, but the problem with that is when we eventually, Tim dies or this project winds down, um, this is going to have to be sold to somebody and for order them for, for them to use this as a retail use, they have to either get a variance from the county because this is 3.3 and they need four, or they have to demolish the rear part of the building to make less space because they don't have this much parking. So what this represents is a roll of the dice for us, the Pinball Collectors Club, whether we will be able to sell this 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now and be able to get a decent return on it because this is only at 3.3 instead of where it should be at 4. Now, if we do sell it, we could tell the buyer, okay, there's two prices. One price if you can get the variance, and a greatly reduced price if you can't and you have to demolish part of the building. Now, you could say that, well, here's this pinball collector's club. We've, we've donated you know, millions of dollars to local charities. These are good guys. Let's go ahead and do it. But then what if somebody doesn't like that and they want a variance because they're nice guys too and pretty soon all and up, up and down the strip, everybody's asking for variances based on what they gave us. So the development people have said, look, we don't know what the future holds. The way Uber and Lyft has changed the tourist dynamic in Las Vegas has been huge. Instead of a $40 cab ride, that you have to talk to a rude operator on a telephone, you have to put two quarters in a payphone, call a cab company, get treated rudely, and then wait a half an hour, maybe the cab will show up. Now you press a button on your cell phone, you can track the driver, he shows up, and it costs considerably less for an Uber or a Lyft. And let me tell you, the, the wreckage of the cab companies in Las Vegas couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch of people. <laughs> so. The, the development people are saying, look, we don't know what the future is going to be of transportation in Las Vegas. Maybe it'll be self-driving cars. They're talking about putting 
a, a light rail up and down the strip. We don't know. But if it moves away from individuals arriving in cars, then a variance will be easier. If it continues to be everybody drives their own individual car and has to have a parking space, then we may have trouble. So what we've come down to as of today is that we're still negotiating with the guy that owns this and this. And we've kind of arrived at a price for an additional 40 feet, which will give us more parking and more building. The depth is the same. We're just getting an extra 40 feet, and we're sliding the whole thing down to the south so that we're directly next to the Harley. That gives him one contiguous piece of 10 acres here and 22 acres over here. Everything from um, uh, Dewey Drive south would be his except for us and the Harley. Um, we've arrived at a price of $1.6 million for 40 more feet. Um, then we would have to pay an additional $2.8 million for um, additional building. So it would take an $8.1 million project to a $10.5 million project. But it would be big enough to support parking at four spaces per thousand, which would mean we would have an automatic sale. Also, the problem with 120 feet of width is that as you're driving down the strip, literally if you blink, you're going to miss it. So it really isn't big enough. I would be more comfortable at 160. And because of the fact that we couldn't put another row of parking here without more, we could actually put a second double row of parking in here and have one, two, three, four, five instead of three. So it becomes more efficient the wider it gets. So we would be able to basically make this 35,000 square feet and we would have this parking supported at four. So this is the preferred solution. I don't know where we're going to end up on this because we're right in the middle of negotiations with these people and they don't answer their phone much. So worst case scenario is we own this, we can go ahead and build it. We can put a partition here so that the rear part of the building could be demolished if we had to eventually when we sold it. So we could do that, uh, but we're ready to go on this. So that's basically the whole thing. And the reason I'm here is because I have taken this project by myself about as far as I can. And at this point, I need some help. I need the pinball community, please, to open up your wallets. And what we've decided to do is have memberships available in the Las Vegas Pinball Collectors Club. Up until now, it's kind of been like the Ann Arbor Collectors Club, where Clay says, OK, say the magic word, spin around three times, and you're a member. Pick up a wrench, fix that game. That's kind of where we've been at. But now, the IRS would prefer a stronger board of directors for our organization. It's, it's fine to have one guy in charge when you're just small, but as you grow larger, you need to have some input from a board of directors that's a little stronger than whatever Tim wants, give it to him. And we also need to get some other people as members who pay dues and carry a membership card and all that. So we've decided that we're going to actually solicit the pinball community to become members. Now, what this gets you is, of course, a T-shirt and a DVD disc and all that other stuff, all the little premiums. This also allows us to sell, oh, I said that word. I can't say that word. Give you a T-shirt when you buy, no, not buy. When you join, you get a free T-shirt. That way, there's no sales tax liability. I'm already doing three or four tax returns. I don't want to get into the swamp of sales tax. So what we're doing is we're giving you some gifts for joining our club. And we've, we've decided that we're also going to have a wall of fame, which is going to be on the wall as you come in, that will, be, that will list all the people that have made this possible. Um, we've got different levels. We've got a smaller plaque for $50 memberships. We've got 
a larger $100 plaque. We've got $500. We've actually had three people that have given me $500. And then if you want 10,000, 20,000, basically whatever you want, we will make it bigger based on how much you want to give. Uh, we're also thinking about offering the ability to sponsor an actual machine. If you love Pinbot, you could sponsor Pinbot and have your name on the machine. Um, all sorts of things. Unfortunately, I've been so busy taking care of all of this that I haven't really concentrated much on the actual club membership thing, but uh, it's something that should happen and it's, it's, it's a way for everybody else to help. It would also give you some additional uh, membership benefits that would include a private area inside the museum, probably back in one of the corners, that would offer uh, use of equipment that's too fragile and too old to let the public touch. Um, I've got some really old, really unique stuff, uh, pre-flipper, Bagatelle stuff. Um, I was talking to Pat Hamlet about the very nice stuff, and he was surprised that I still have all of it. But yes, we have everything I've ever owned, I still own, and I'm holding on to like this. Uh, who's seen The Hoarders Show? Have you seen The Hoarders? That's me. That's me. They should do a pinball edition of Hoarders. So I have all kinds of neat stuff that I don't really want the public to see and touch, but I know I could trust you people to come in there and not put your fist through it. So I'm going to offer a separate area in the back for members only. Uh, originally we had talked about, with the architect, putting a second floor on here, but then we ran into the same problem we did here with parking. Even for storage, a dead storage area needs two spaces per thousand. And we could probably get a variance for that but then again, when we go to sell it, the second owner is not going to pay us a nickel for the second floor. So the architect said, if you want a second floor, it's going to be totally a vanity project, and you're going to lose every nickel you put into it. And the one thing you never say to an Arnold brother is lose money. <clears throat> Don't like. So um, there's going to be other benefits. We're going to have a, a giant grand opening party you know, before the public gets in, and we're going to have, you know, parking privileges. We're going to have an email newsletter as soon as I figure out how to work a computer. I'm kind of a newbie on that. Um, and basically, even if I don't give you anything, please understand that I need this help for several reasons. First of all, to get to this 8.1, or if we do the bonus add-on, for an extra two and a half million, it's beginning to stretch the abilities of what we can do. Uh, and second of all, it shouldn't be just about me and my little pinball club. I need the input and help of other people at this point. So based on my past track record of doing for 10, 15 years exactly what I said I'm gonna do and having eight to 10 years worth of tax returns that state that nobody has been paid and that we have done charitable work. And based on all this, I'm asking, please jump in and join. Um, that's basically it. Uh, open it up to questions. Anybody? Right here. Yes. Um, have you pursued or thought about corporate sponsors? Uh, yes, but at this point, we're a little rough around the edges, and most of the corporate things want slick presentations and the strong museum is an excellent idea of something that will attract corporate sponsorship because it's clean it's pretty it's not just a bunch of guys in an old auto parts store with a bunch of pinball machines they dug out of dumpsters that's the same problem that the uh, Pacific Pinball Museum ran into when they tried to get corporate sponsorship is well you guys are kind of too downtown for us. You know, we need something that's slick. We don't want to get Microsoft or one of those big companies, General Motors, whoever, involved with something where all the signs are handwritten and you have one toilet and one sink. It's, if you don't mind, could we exchange information after the presentation? I might have a lead for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, again, I'm here, besides begging for money, I'm here to ask for input. 
and I'll be in Jim Shelberg's booth. Is Jim Shelberg here? No, Jim Shelberg is never here. Uh, I think he's a mystery man. I'm, I'm in his booth in the vendor area. You can look at this close up and get some ideas. I've got some other uh, things you can look at. Uh, please, pick my brain. I'm, I'm looking to enlarge this beyond the Tim and his buddy show. It's time to make this a little bit nicer, a little bit, you wouldn't believe the bathrooms we got planned for this. Um, uh, it's going to be something I think the pinball community can be a little bit more proud of. Um, other questions? Here. here. Uh, about the permits, how many more permits do you need for the plan that's drawn there? And if you went to the bonus space, the 160 feet frontage, how many of the permits you already have would have to be reapplied? Uh, we have, this is, could basically be tacked on here fairly easily. We're going to have to pay a second time for uh, surveys and soil drainage and stuff like that. So we're going to be burning twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 of work that's already gone into this. Uh, our architect is working for free at this point. He's a club member. Um, I have yet to pay for a drawing on this, and anybody that's, that's had drawings like this prepared, this is a $500 bill right here. Um, so we're still trying to do this as thriftily as possible, but I am signing a lot of checks. And the, the, the things that we have here can easily be moved here and made larger. And also, our tax exemptions and licensing uh, waivers that we have on Tropicana, I've already worked with the politicians to move those over here seamlessly. And it really helps when it comes, it's a g -g -g ghost. We were just talking about you, homie. I um, No, we have a timeline from the architect. Everything is on schedule that's, that's, that will get us out before the end of the 21 months. And it was three months additional that we could buy. When this 40 feet extra came up, I went to the car wash guys and said, can we make the three months 10 months? And he said, yeah, sure, but I can't go beyond 10 months. So we're definitely out of there at the end of 31 months. Uh, we're homeless. And it's not a money thing, it's a time thing. And what if, you know, some permit doesn't happen and the builder's ready to build, but we can't until this happens, but this guy's on vacation and this guy's wife is pregnant and it's not going to happen today. So that's what we're looking at. Um, I have never worked harder than I'm currently working and I've never made less money. I just took $1.2 million out of my pocket and loaned it to a pinball club. What kind of a dumb shit does something like that? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, this is way out here on the edge of weird, believe me. Uh, other questions? Yes. Okay, what, one of the reasons I wanted to do this with more space and why we were even contemplating a Kmart, if this is three times the Pinball Hall of Fame, the Kmart would have been 10 times the Pinball Hall of Fame. And one reason why is I have a storage building in my backyard that's full to the rafters with stuff, some of which I haven't seen in 15, 20 years. Literally, there's stuff in front of it. And I've got a file card on every game, but that's not the same as having a collection that's up and running. And Clay, who does the Ann Arbor pinball thing, is constantly giving me shit about how, you know, I've got all this stuff, I should either sell it or I should use it, but just having it sit in storage is wrong. And I agree with that. And part of the idea was, if I figure this is going to be the final space, this is going to be the absolute last thing I'm going to do with this project, that's as big as it's going to get. I'm going to pick, now we currently have 250 games in the Pinball Hall of Fame, and they're shoehorned in this much space. So if I want to go to three times that space, I also want to space them out a little bit. We want wider aisleways. If you've been in the Pinball Hall of Fame on a Saturday, it's impossible to walk through the place because there's so many people. So what we want to do is stretch this out, not to 750 games, but stop at about 600. That gives us plenty of room to move around 
It gets us new ADA compliant bathrooms instead of old ADA compliant bathroom with one sink and one toilet. It gets us a lot of advantages and I'll be able to take the number 600 and go through my collection and say, I got 600 slots. I want this many of this game, this many of this game, this many Williams games, this many of this. I'll get a final list of 600. Everything else will get sold off, traded, parted out. I've got some games that, should, that were in fires and floods and will never work again that need to be parted out and the parts stored away. Basically, I've got, I could go to 600 real easy because if you remember Fun Night, Fun Night I had four or 500 games that ran perfectly. Those games still run perfectly. The rubber has dry rotted and I have to convert them from incandescent bulbs to LEDs. I have to re-lubricate them, but the heavy lifting has been done. Everything has been rebuilt. The games are in great shape. So with an hour or two on each game, I could get large quantities of games available immediately to fill this. And I remember when we were thinking about getting another building, I said, why did I spend all that time rebuilding all this equipment, putting new play fields on, <clears throat> upgrading the fasteners, new play field posts? You know, why did I put so much work into this and now I'm never going to use it? I should either get a big, bigger building and use it or I should sell it all. So this is where it's going to end up. 600 games, empty the shed. We got a, a, a slogan, flip it, rip it, or ship it. We're going to flip it into the collection, we're going to rip it apart, or we're going to ship it off to somebody else by selling it. So that's what's going to happen to all the games in the hitch shed in my backyard. Uh, other questions? Yeah, a very good project you're doing, but you spent about the IRS wanting to have a formal board and directors, et cetera. What are you going to do about the club in terms of setting up a, a more formal uh, terms of memorandum? Identify who's doing what and uh, the accounts and all that sort of thing. Well, we, we're meticulously on time with all our filings. And we have a board of directors currently. It's just not very strong. It's basically Tim's running the show. Once a year, we have a meeting of the, I think we have four, five, six people on our board. All of them are local. All of them are friends of mine. There is no outside directors, there's no dissent. It's pretty much a timocracy, and it's, it, things happen if I want them to happen, but that can't really continue on like this. And truthfully, a lot of the stuff we do is just plain ass backwards and unprofessional. And there's people that constantly come in and say, yeah, this place has charm. But what they're really saying is, it's an old auto parts store with pinball machines that you fill, that you dug out of dumpsters, and now you're, you're in here. It's kind of great, but it's not very cute. And if there's one thing that American consumers like, it's cute. So if we're going to take this to the next level, I'm going to have to get some outside input. We're not in non-compliance with anything the IRS or the state wants us to be. But we really can't go to the next level until I start hiring and paying people and getting some outside input. Uh, other questions? Yes. Uh, which what? Oh yeah, the Bally sign. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, John Papaduke was moving out of his garage in Chicago and he said, I've got this sign we took off the Bally building. So I have the Bally Harlequin sign. Uh, some people call it the gear guy. It's their little logo with the space age thing. The neon is broken, but that matters nothing now because everything's gone to LEDs. I have all the pieces of it. It's sitting in storage in the hitch shed. It could be easily attached to the side of the building here and illuminated, or it could be put on a pole somewhere here just as a display item. Uh, it's all bent stainless steel. Uh, it's got plastic inserts. If you've seen pictures of the Bally building uh, back in the day, it's quite something to see when it's lit up at night. So that's one of our projects that we're going to do here one of these days as soon as I get around to it. Um, other questions? Yes? What happens when Tim Arnold's not around anymore to take care of business? Um, 
Glad you brought that up. This is another reason why we need a stronger board of directors and we need some outside input. The way it is now, if I get hit by a bus, my wife has a simple six word solution to all the problems, is pull the chain, stop the ride. If you've ever worked at Tilt-A-Whirl in a carnival, you have one simple six word instruction about what happens if a kid falls off or gets his leg caught in a gear. Pull the chain, stop the ride. So what would happen is basically at this point, if I get hit by a bus, it's over. And there may be a chance that this could continue on beyond me, but I can't get apprentices or people to commit to doing this project unless I pay them. And unless I say, you have a future here, you, I can teach you what you need, but it'll take five years for me to give you the knowledge, like uh, who's that little space critter? Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, no, uh, Yoda, Yoda. So if, if I could teach some kid, uh, and by the way, anybody younger than me is a kid, so I'm an old man. So if I could teach a kid how to do this, it could continue on because I got news for you, it's not rocket science, it's just pinball machines. 99% uh, of what's required is showing up every day and doing it. The rest of it isn't really that difficult. And again, we have templates in place and we own this and we own that. The, 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 the basis of this is built on a rock solid foundation financially uh, we're in great shape. Um, we will continue to be in great shape even if we go with this and this. Our debt to equity and debt to sales ratios are still in the comfortable range. This is not undoable. It's just going to mean that we're going to have to reach outside for a little bit and, and get this done one way or the other. But it could continue on. However, if you look at the success rate of museums, tourist attractions, unique things that have been started by one person and carried on by another person, the failure rate is about 80%. It's not promising that somebody could take this over. If you want an example of that, right across the street from our current facility is the Liberace Museum. And the day Liberace died, the looting started. And people were wholesale taking off out of there with diamond covered pianos and the real estate got flipped between some board members three or four times and somehow mysteriously ended up in private hands and automobiles disappeared and jewelry disappeared and at this point if I suddenly found out I had cancer and if today I had to stop doing it I would do an orderly liquidation and get out of it honorably and give as much money as I could to local social service charities. And it's probably today worth more in pieces than it is as a whole. Um, other questions? I'm, I don't understand the question. Yes. No, we, uh, we, it's like I say, we're, we're kind of a museum disguised as an arcade, and yes, we do have every new stirred, not stirred, I gotta stop calling stirreds. They're sterns. We have every new stern game that comes out. We've bought a couple of the Jersey Jack games. Yes, we do put new games in simply because you can't have pinball without new as well as old. Also, you can't run old games without something to pay the bills. And new games are a dollar a play, old games are a quarter. Do the math. You have to sell four times as much of this as this. We also sell soft drinks, but we sell ours from a vending machine instead of a snack bar. And, and what? Oh, swag, yes. We will be selling swag. I have resisted that up to this point, but for those of you who have already sent in your membership and haven't received your shirt and your DVD discs, let me tell you about 
what you should never do is get other club members, <coughs> females, involved with designing a shirt because all of a sudden, I would have said, look, we have this shirt. I've got a shirt with me I'll show you in Jim Shelberg's booth. And I said, let's call the big t-shirt printer in Phoenix and order 10,000 of these. And they'll cost us $2.25 at that level. That's great. We'll have 10,000 of them. We'll have a mix of sizes. We won't have to mess with it again. They said, oh, no, no, no. That's not good enough. We have to put a collar on it. We have to put a pocket. Oh, no, but we need to move the pocket over here and this logo over here. And this logo back here must look like the famous Las Vegas sign. And it went around and around and into design and back from design. And I'm stuck on that one. The DVD discs I did myself. It looks amateurish. It looks downtown. But damn it, it's done and it's ready today. So the shirts are coming. The final design, the witches. I'm sorry. We call them the witches of East Trap because they run the show. I'm just sitting in a corner fixing games, and they're making all the decisions now. Um, they've decided what the shirt is going to be, and very soon we will have shirts. And these will be a limited run of 600. I'm not ordering 10,000 on these. So these will be nicer quality, and they might or might not have a pocket, and they might or might not have a collar. The ones that I wanted to do for $2.25 were a t-shirt. Uh, but getting back to you, I'm sorry I deviated from your question. Um, yes, we do other things other than old pinball. We do the new stuff. We do snacks. We sell uh, Mike and Ike's from a turn the crank machine. We also do crane machines. And let me tell you about the mentality of Las Vegas is people like to win things. And they go to the casinos and they don't win anymore. They put in 20, 50, 100 dollars and two hours later it's all gone. And they said, what happened to winning? I came to Vegas and I used to win. Then they come out to the Pinball Hall of Fame, they put 50 cents in the crane and they grab an animal. And they go, boy, that was a fluke, I'm gonna try that again. And they put another 50 cents in the crane and they win another animal. And then 15 minutes later they come up with this giant thing full of animals and they say, do you have a garbage bag? And we're able to do this because, anybody know the answer to this? We get free stuffed animals from the Salvation Army. Let me tell you, if you donate millions of dollars to local social service charities, all of a sudden doors open up for you that you never even imagined were there. When kids get toys now, they don't play with them until they wear out. Back in the 1900s when I was growing up, we had one block of a rock we used to play with until we wore it out. And now kids get hundreds of toys, they look at them once, they put them on a shelf, and then when they get too big for their toys, their mom donates them all to the Salvation Army. They're not used, they're brand new. They still have the labels on them. Half of them are still in the boxes. And they were s selling these toys, these stuffed animals, to rag merchants who would take them over to China, shred them up, and put them in as stuffing for mattresses. And they were getting like nothing for these toys. And uh, after one of our big donations, they said, hey, do you want any toys? And I go, hell yes, I'm a cheap brick bastard. Give me all the toys I can get. So now we get free stuffed animals, and because we don't pay for the animals, we've turned the crane voltage all the way up, and people win like crazy. And it's really worked out well for us. Getting back to your question, yes, we do do things other than classic pinballs. Ancillary income streams, which is what this is all called, is about 15% of our income now. And the new games are 20 to 30%. So we're almost half non-old pinballs. Question. OK, I lost the last part of it. You're going to have to speak up. I'm, I'm, I'm deaf. I've lived in a pinball arcade. Yeah. Everybody know this guy? Hey. This guy is in Prince Among Men. Um, I, I've watched what you've done over all these years from when it was a concept with skepticism and then amazement um, at what you've accomplished, um, particularly 
um, we're plugged into the Vegas world and seeing how the Pinball Museum has become a tourist attraction on everybody's list of what to do outside of casinos. And that's got a lot to do, I think, with the success that you've had. Um, I am amazed that even with your, your hundreds of thousands of dollars of charitable donations, that you ended up with $3.4 million in the bank to sit here and make this whole vision possible. Because we all scratched our heads and said, you know, 4.6 million, what, what the hell is Tim doing? Which is what we've said every year and every step of the way, what, what is Tim doing? Um, I listened to your plans and and, and again, you pull rabbits out of your hat regularly. The car wash is serendipity up to the stars. So that we look at moving from we're going to get a $3.5 million loan to we're going to get $2.8 million and the guy's going to let us sit here for 21 months while they build our building. And you quickly do the math and you're $500,000 away from completing your plan um, and, of course, owing you $1.2 million. Um, and I look at that, and in 21 months, at the rate you're going, you'll probably be able to generate a lot of that 500,000. So you are in a comfortable position to build an amazing facility on an amazing piece of real estate for a business that is running and thriving and operating. Okay? And then I hear you talk about 3.3 parking spaces. And I want 800 games, not 600 games. And we're going to make this whole thing ridiculous and have to raise all kinds of money and uncertainty and craziness. And if there's anyone that can do it, I, 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 you know, I, I've watched the show. But, but to me, it, it seems like what you don't have... In, in this equation, and you said it yourself, people want to see cute, they want to see it nice, they want to see something dressed up. If I were, the, if I were on your board, right. I would tell you to go with this plan, okay, stay where you are, forget the 40 feet, forget the parking, build your thing and, and raise a little bit of money to make your place nice so that you go from here to here once you're next to everybody on the strip. Yes, believe me, that's a very valid point. And I would like to say about 50% of the time, I want to tell these guys that own this down here just to take a hike because they're not easy to deal with. Uh, they're not very communicative. This is ready to go, and it's a perfectly fine thing. I don't really need more, much more space than this. I could certainly make this work with a couple storage trailers out back for parts. And part of me says, this is perfect. Keep it simple, stupid. Don't go for the extra 40 feet. Don't move down here. And you also have to keep in mind that I won't be able to build a plain concrete white building. If you've ever seen our current facility, it's, everything is white, it's simply because it reflects light and it keeps our air conditioning bill low. So the insides and the outsides are just plain vanilla white. The architect, the first meeting I had with him, he said, look, you know you're not going to be able to do a plain box on the strip. There's a separate level of development on the strip, which is draconian. They want to see flying buttresses. They want to see uh, brick inlays. They want to see, the architect said, let's take this whole wall and put glass blocks there with neon, changing color neon behind it, and have it glow and change colors like a jukebox. And I will not be able to pull off plain vanilla on the strip. They won't give me a building permit until I have something that the strip development people like. So I'm not going to be able to pull off what I did before. And yes, our current floors are pitted and full of cracks. We filled the cracks with concrete so you're not tripping on them, but there's still cracks there. Our walls are plain. Our ceiling is plain. We're talking with the architect about some wi windows. And it, it, it's going to be a lot nicer simply because it has to be based on where it is. You can't put 
an old auto parts store full of pinball machines on the strip. They're not going to let us do it. So yeah, I am prepared to make some changes. I am prepared to make it nicer, especially since we saved money on buying the land by prevailing at the auction. And now if the deal goes through on Monday, we'll be pretty much close to maybe if you squint a little bit out of debt. So yeah, we can spend some money on some gigaws. Um, and that guy has been in on this project since the beginning. Um, nothing but nice to say. Thank you, sir. Uh, other questions? Does this place have to be louder than the Libre Auction Museum in order for it to be on the strip? No, it's gonna, no not going to have to be louder. They want either totally tasteless and loud like a volcano in front of your casino or a pirate ship where people are falling off of it or they want something. The current thing is the 60s architecture with the, the they call it googly or something. It's, it's 60s stuff with balls and stuff like that. That, that would work for us. Um, I'm talking to a sign guy. I had, I had jokingly told the sign guy that I wanted the, the cowboy that's downtown that does this, only I wanted it to go in his nose, pull out a booger, head goes back, uh, uh. Ah, ah, ah. And sure enough, he brought me back a plan that showed a sign with a cowboy picking his nose and eating it. So that sign would cost us $200,000. Um, one reason I need an outside board of directors is to keep my impulses to be goofy under control. So I kind of, that kind of got shot down. Um, and we're probably going to have something 60-ish looking uh, there's a guy that just rehabbed a shopping center in the arts district. Uh, it used to be the ghetto, now it's the art district, uh, who put up this amazing sign that looks like the 60s. And he said that we could use his templates to remake that sign with our face on it. So I could have something for less than $200,000 that looks real nice. And the idea is that there's some overhead power lines in part of this and part of it is available for a sign. Um, I want to have big, garish, and overlit. Another thing I want is a parking lot with LED lighting that would bring the lighting levels somewhere near the surface of the sun. I'm tired of, of being in the dark at night. And also, vandalism goes down if you have bright lights. And bright lights also make the place look like what White Castle used to look like, which is this bright thing in the night where you drive down the road and, holy cow, what is that? It's hurting my eyes. So yeah, we're definitely gonna up, up our game here, up our game here, and a big, huge sign here. Uh, other questions? Yeah, that's, that's in the 125 a foot. And again, as, as we've saved a little money here and there, if we don't go for the extra 40 feet, we could put in you know, gold-plated fixtures in the bathroom, and we could put in a lounge area, and you know, we, could, we could be a little more creative with a little more money. And also, I say that our debt-to-equity ratio is comfortable, on the high side of comfortable. If, if you look at the casino companies, Caesars Entertainment at this point is basically broke. They've got $3 billion in equity and $3 billion worth of debt. So they're basically worthless. And they seem to think that everything is fine and that the world can continue on with this huge debt burden. I'm kind of fanatically the other way. If this was a normal business, this debt to equity ratio wouldn't be comfortable, it would be low. So yes, if we need to, we can go to the bank and borrow money instantly based on the fact that we have equity. Um, I don't like banks and I don't like paying interest and I've avoided it thus far simply by hoisting the pirate flag and say we're doing this ourselves, get out of our way. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Ah, the commando machine guns. Does every, anybody remember Riverview Park? Yeah, do you remember the commando BB machine guns? Yeah. 
I have uh, a set of five and four machines I've acquired since I bought the set of five for parts. Uh, I have 100,000 steel balls. Um, I don't know how well Chinese-made steel balls will hold up compared to the Hoover steel balls I got with the five guns, but I had them at the last fun night. Was anybody at the last fun night and saw the, the BB machine guns? Yeah, okay. Those are ready to go. Uh, I have to build some targets, but one of our club members is a machinist, and he said he will help me design targets that will withstand steel balls. If, if you're thinking in your mind, this is the shootout the star game at the carnival, that's a Feltman air rifle that uses collapsible lead shot. This is nothing like a Chicago coin commando machine gun, which has a compressor built into the gun that shoots individual steel balls at a fast rate, and they ricochet and they throw sparks and they take people's eyes out. It's, it's a wonder to behold, anybody that's played one. Uh, that's going to be available for play. Um, as soon as I turn John loose, he's going to take a week off from work and we're going to spend a week making a target set for it. But is the exact set that was at Riverview Park in Chicago. I have the providence on that. Um, yes? Ah, well, I'm here at the show. I'll take PayPal's. Uh, if you've got a credit card, uh, I'll take cash money, or you can do it at your leisure at home. Uh, you can send a check. It's fully tax deductible beyond the couple of small gifts that you get. You're going to get a T-shirt and a DVD disc. Other than that, it's 100% deductible on your taxes. Uh, I have all my IRS documentation available. Um, it's easy, it's fun, and I could use the help mentally and financially. So I'm, yeah, here's the man. All right, so you can, uh, for the purposes of the recording, I'll mention that uh, if you don't see Tim this weekend in person, there is a pin side thread that says LVPCC and you know the Hall of Fame to close and stuff. So you can find it there on uh, pin side if you, uh, don't do it this time, but you can ask Tim more questions at uh, the Pin Game Journal booth in the vendor hall. And uh, for those of you who are Las Vegas gambling types, uh, Mega Millions, last I heard this morning, was up to $970 million. So buy a ticket and you can give a little of that winnings to the Pinball Hall of Fame after you hit big on Mega Millions. So thank you, Tim. Good luck.
need that for anything? I brought a clamp for an iPod. Do we need that for anything? For And so what do you want to do? The only thing is, I, we don't have any other ones. Do what? <laughs> I thought that they would have a uh, computer that we can put the power point on. No, that's Tim Old News. Do what? That's Tim Old News. I think he's just... Um, well, somebody was working over there. Yeah, we'll have to find who it is. We have to use, or do you think we should just do a snowball mic right here? I thought about two snowballs. Oh, really? One here and one there. It might catch. I know, that's oh. what I was worried about, that's why I didn't know if it was But what's wrong with one? We can try one. I just didn't know if it would. I mean, if it's shit audio, I'd rather have shit audio than unusable audio. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unless you, I mean, that's your call. Doesn't matter. No, well, we can try that one. Okay. Does your pole come out longer than that? Or? Oh, it does. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good angle, though. We can try. It's the real deal here, Tim. I mean, I guess so. We don't, uh, it's straight down the middle. We don't mess up. You got the, the uh, PowerPoint thing? It's too cool. Yes, sir. You want me to put that? Do you know how to work that thing? Mm -mm. Yeah. Figure it out, though. Mm. Did you review the PowerPoint? I did this morning. Looks good. Are you yeah. okay with that? Yeah. Most yeah. of those are What's happening, Mark? Who's going to be in the middle? Who's going to be on the side? Lower that mic. I think you guys should be sitting next to each other. Okay. Not you. Doesn't matter. Straight down the middle. Doesn't matter. If that's the case, I should be in the middle so that put the podcast straight down the middle. Okay. You know what I mean? That sounds good.
Oh, it's, it's still controlled over the desk. Oh, okay. So, so you're down that, that one. That one's way. Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, no, I'm picking up that one. <laughs> stretch and do something. Sit down real quick. Let me get this so I can shut the camera off. Good with that. Yeah, it can't come up anymore. Yeah. What, forward? Yep. Uh, or hold up, yeah, because we got three. Oh, here. Yeah, I mean, we got three, so it's just having to this. Yeah, do whatever you want. Hey Jeff, will you take take a seat? A seat. Oh, they've got the uh, their map on the front. That's what he's saying. Well, you're the two famous guys I saw just on YouTube. I I, I like laugh so hard. On oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank like you. The, I saw one that you were doing on the ramps. Oh, yep. Yep. Oh, top, ten ramps. top ten ramps. Yeah. And then, like, you didn't like the Iron Maiden, and it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we like the Iron, just not the theme. We didn't like yeah. the music. But we made a lot of people mad. Yeah, I know, everybody. So you need to actually, I don't know, did you see the Oktoberfest? Maybe you should actually, re like, uh, addition, because the new ramp, what they have on Oktoberfest, like, from American That's true. People, that, that's that's a very, very interesting. Huge one. ramp, it isn't it? Wow. Really? This it's is smooth, like, too. Yeah, it's very, like, it's just, it's unbelievable. And even the 180 smooth. ramp that comes around. Yep. But then you, like, twist it like this. And oh, yeah. It's like a stuff. waterfall. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. That's awesome. And he said that even with a, a multiple, it's mm -hmm. still, like, a yeah, it's very cool. good. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, no, I, I, I think that I, I saw at least, like, uh, one or two of your YouTube Oh, thanks. Like it. We it's appreciate awesome. it. So. We very much appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, uh, going back and forward. Hey, will you sit down there one more time? I'm going to see how bad that all blocks you. <coughs> hey, Nicole, do you have that water? I'll peek around and <coughs> it's all good. All right, so got this. I'm going to open up all that so you get that print. Because if you, we'll still be able to figure out a stretch point or something. Bring me any gloves.
seven out of ten, maybe. Do what? Seven out of ten. Maybe. We'll bring you to a ten. I'd have probably dipped out crying. Either way. I love what I got. Like, I saw his skin last night. I was like, wow, I can't believe you came here. <laughs> what did he tell you? Like, uh, Coogler told us, because we were talking about, like, our upload time. We didn't know what our upload time would be, so the video from Coogler was like, hey, you can just upload it, but just make it private on YouTube, and then you just take it off of private. And we were like, well, yeah, you know, yeah. that just leaves room for I'm something to go now. wrong. And, and that's what we were terrified about because Zach was like, if you got, got it private, does, does it just show up for us when we log in or does it private just for our subscribers or what? I said, I don't know. I said, I think we just fucking deal with the, private deal with the upload yeah, until we test it and everything because I hate trying to get this. Everything technology-wise for us goes wrong. Yeah. Like, the audio don't work. Shit yeah. comes out of focus. Like, like we have the worst time with technology. So we, as much as we can stay... To what we know, we, yeah, we get away from it. But this is it. Next, you've done it. Oh, I know. Every, I everything. Just, I have not. Uh, I haven't posted um, like in the evening before. Did he tell you what it was? Yeah, like the military. Yeah. 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 I've got them saved both as a '97 and 2003 PPT, and one of the newer PPTXs. So I'm hoping a PPTX works. Depends yeah. on how old their computer is. Because if not, I think your graphs might be. I'm thinking on the graphs that I'm thinking those will be like the shortest part of. I would the just yeah run through and say yeah. you know best artwork the way you like. Yeah. And Wolf, I mean, as you're talking in typical my fashion, I'll be interrupting and yeah, and like oh, conversation sure. just like a normal like phone call. That's right. Yeah. Are we gonna be good laptop? He, yeah, he's kind of somebody to laptop because they're coming. <coughs> Hit record on this. I'm gonna set it down there so it's one less thing. Yeah. Well, so what was unfortunate is they would have a Walker laptop. I was told that we would have a laptop, and then get that turned off for me. Yes. Assuming we have that 30 minutes on. Yes. Do it's right. off. You know. How long are we up here? 45. I can reach out and stop it and restart it real quick. Yeah. If you're okay it with that. Very so this mic is gonna pick it up. Both of them. No, this mic will yeah. be recording with this for strictly audio. Uh, sometimes we get a better recording off of this. Okay. Uh, We're but the shotgun up. will also be active <coughs> into the camera. I would just project. Yeah, oh, uh, I don't, no, I don't think we're going to have a problem. Josh talked so soft yesterday. And it, took, it picked it right up. Honestly. Like, it's got to let me know if I can suck in a little bit. I know. Did you see the picture he took of me? Uh -oh. put online? It was horrible. Now Frank's just calling me a chubby fat dispenser. <laughs> <laughs> Lord. So we don't have a laptop? There, he's working to bring oh, okay. Waiting for the last stop. If all else fails, we can. We still get 10 minutes. We can go down the road. 10 minutes. Anyway, I got lucky with because uh, I saw I posted it and it like went public. So I shut my laptop because I thought I just scheduled it. So then I like got my stuff and uh, but I'm just so like compulsive about that. I was like, I'm gonna like triple check this yeah. thing. So I like opened it and it was not that I didn't it was live. Spirit. It was like yeah. like yeah. five, ten minutes later and it was I mean, live. Yeah. It was like oh for God. Oh, I'm the same way like on the way up here. It's like I start reaching back for the camera case. 
<laughs> and I was bringing it, unzip my bag, there it was. I was just like, here. Yeah. Because I was like, you know, my mind races like yours. But, yeah. But when I can soothe it, like, it, 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 I gotta, I gotta know that it's yeah. important. Like you said, then I thought my worst fears, <laughs> like yours, yeah. were, were actually coming true. I'm just glad I was able to catch it. Like, I'm glad I didn't get here and realize that it was like, somebody was like, hey, you do. That was so. Yeah, it's like freaking five minutes and we're going to get home here. Who is monitoring my website right now? Does it send out notifications or is it? <coughs> it does like at 8 o'clock in the morning. But that's but it. But it doesn't like oh, like right yeah, somebody, so somebody was like on there. Uh, Being that it's so close to time, they might have just been checking for updates. Like yeah. people are so aim. I do that. I refresh yeah. what's on there. Yeah, because somebody tends to screw up at some point. <laughs> My turn, I guess. I would, man. I would worry too much. You think it's got a whole year for it to calm down? Like you make good graces with that. Yeah. I don't think it's gonna screw with nobody else. I don't. I would. I'd personally stay quiet about it. So, not make it known. Not apologize too much. I don't think people be able to do it coming from you. Just. Let me see how it plays out. So don't spook anybody. Part of me is like, did uh, like JJP saw that or anybody else? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, reach them out. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't say anything unless it's brought up, unless you've got a door that you go to get something again and they're like, you know, really. Yeah. Then I would, you know, maybe then beg and explain. Yeah. But I think you should, you stay quiet because I tend to be like, yeah, like I overreact and I talk too much to too many people. Yeah. And it would have turned out a lot better, but just, I know, I'll stay quiet, but I'd like, you know, like, I'll just press the space bar to We should have drew Jeff's face and stuck it next to us on a, <laughs> on a piece of paper. We should have. What time are you going? Three minutes. Uh, are you, I'm going to go. And Jim, whenever you get a second password. Ah, right here. You can come up here and then. Do we have to turn on this projector? Uh, oh, it's on. It's just um, it's got black coming out of the HDMI at the moment. Yeah. Because it's not logged in. Oh, you might. Oh, it's logged in. It's just a. Uh, you might have to do connect to a. Yeah, just taking its time. That's all. Oh, it's taking its time. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, we would say, I know, 
what he's done. Mm-hmm. He's going to squish on you. Okay. Do you want to scan? No. And then no. Right next to it. Okay. Right there? Okay. Is that, is that the biggest that will go on there? No, we no. can make it bigger. Then. Okay. Now we gotta find people would laugh. We really should do that. That's gonna be hilarious. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. I'm gonna try to figure out Windows 7 how to pull up a PowerPoint here. Do you have? Okay. I'm using the Max. Are you trying to get to the thumbnail? Yeah. Go to the file folder. Where? File folder right there next to that. Yeah. Yeah, you do it there, Chief. Welcome back to 2010. It's actually better.